Welcome to Second Earth Infinity. You might want to get your thinking caps on because we have a new segment related to how we deal with the subject of reality, illusions, UFOs, conspiracies, basically all of the above, but in a more philosophical nature. So today I wanted to talk about something that in all honesty is going to be very hard to encapsulate in just 12 minutes because I want to talk about how some concepts of science might actually merge with the concepts of religion. Now, I'm not gonna specifically talk about any religion or any God uh, to that effect, but so much as to try to bridge certain concepts, certain physical ideas, uh, meaning the laws of physics, and uh, you know even concepts like love, uh, quantum entanglement, things like that. So while some might consider this to be a form of nihilism as if we're going to some kind of uh, never-ending abyss, I actually believe it to be more of an infinite scope of possibilities. You know, we are very smart conscious beings that have capabilities that are even beyond what we sometimes believe we have. And this has been verified through science. It has been verified through different laboratories like the Pair Laboratories in Princeton, which has shown that even random numbers generators can be affected by the human conscious mind. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean that in the end, though we may not be able to singularly affect a single particle at a single given moment in time, in aggregate, it's as if we are somehow yielding reality to our very understanding of reality, meaning I think, therefore I am. And so I decided to break down this episode in three different subjects. And uh, no, I'm not thinking about the Holy Trinity, but we do have three scientific concepts that I wanted to illustrate and kind of give you my uh, personal thoughts about these particular concepts and how they bridge or how I believe they could potentially bridge something closer to the realms of where religion reside. Entropy. The nature of the universe is not that it is completely in a state of entropy. It's more like a blanket of entropy with air pockets of order scattered all around it. If it weren't for the still poorly understood force of gravity, the universe would mostly be a blank. It would be a cold mass of non particles distributed in equal portions with no structure whatsoever, nothing that could be essentially discernible. So in essence, the stars create form and order out of the chaotic actions of the hydrogen particles, but also it serves to simultaneously increase entropy, meaning as order arises, so does chaos. After living a life cycle, some stars blow up into a supernova, and it's this action of living and dying in a fantastical manner so as to blow its inner remains into the cosmos that creates the elementary ingredients that eventually give way to intelligence and conscious creatures in time. Kind of interesting to think that our existence is predicated on the cyclical life cycle of another process of the universe, that only in death could life of this magnitude exist. With an ordered solar system, there is increased entropy due to the chaotic upturnings happening inside the sun and the surrounding solar environment. And in some solar systems, there is added chaos not just in the star themselves, but also in the potential conscious consequences of the beings living in the planets surrounding it. So as a civilization like humanity's ability to organize and civilize, so does the ability to destroy the planet within a whim's notice. Planetary destruction at the trigger of a conscious mind. The Golden Ratio The Golden Ratio, in my opinion, is a necessary ingredient for the epistemological concept of there being a force of consciousness, meaning life could not prosper from any other number than the Golden Ratio itself. Why do I say this? Well, one inescapable nature of the Golden Ratio is that it functions under a fractal mirror-like system. Let's say you have a chopstick in order to give you a challenge. Snap the stick in half, but not perfectly in half. The challenge is to snap the chopstick in such a way that if I were to take a photograph of the bigger piece next to the smaller piece, it would be indistinguishable from a photograph of the bigger piece next to the whole chopstick. In other words, the relationship between the pieces, one divided by the other, are identical. To find this exact place in the chopstick, you simply have to measure the sides until one divided by the other equals exactly the golden ratio, 1.618. 
And this is what I mean by the golden ratio's fractal nature. That though the pieces of the chopsticks are measured differently, if you did not know how to measure it, the pieces in essence would seem identical. Another way to think of it is that in creating a means to replicate oneself in an organized form, the most data efficient system is one to which the building blocks are built upon themselves without any further instruction of how to add or arrange the blocks. Something else to question is if the ever complex nature of these fractal systems are necessary for the creation of consciousness itself. What fascinates me about the fractals is that if it were not for a type of perception, it means to measure or attribute a measurement to the chopsticks themselves, would the chopsticks not be identical to one another in, in, in all other ways of thinking about the chopsticks? It seems that the very act of perception is necessary to give measurements and thus attribute definitive means to differentiating the chopsticks, if you're to think of it in an almost 2D simplistic way. Is the intrinsic fractal nature of the golden ratio related to what is necessary for consciousness to arrive, and consequently, the effects of quantum mechanics itself? Consciousness. One of the most difficult to discuss topics, consciousness is sometimes lost on the words themselves, as if the meaning of the words is not adequate to process all that actually encompasses consciousness. There are competing ideas as to where consciousness arises from. Material scientists will state that consciousness is a side effect or evolutionary consequence to higher order thinking. In essence, they believe that with enough time, one should be able to get to an artificial unit that mimics all the behaviors of the human brain that creates our perception of consciousness. Then there are the proponents of panpsychism, which is more akin to a Buddhist belief that everything is echoed in consciousness, meaning even immaterial objects via its intrinsic nature harbor their own form of rudimentary consciousness. Maybe not as we understand it in ourselves, but perhaps on a cellular level, as how the cells organize with one another, for example crystals, perhaps there is some unknown harmonic means or communication with the universe. Some would say that the organization of the crystals is just a consequence of, of the physics of the universe. Yes, that's true. Yet the universe organizes itself like the human brain. So if the one tree branch fractal nature pattern that we associate with intelligence when analyzing brains under microscopes somehow seems to reappear within the mega structures of the universe, how can we assume that this in and of itself does not constitute its own intelligence or conscious thought to which there is no means for us to easily understand, since that's the only pattern that we seem to understand that is associated with intelligence. So while some ideas propose that even immaterial objects harbor a form of rudimentary consciousness within the atomic structure itself, there is this other idea that consciousness can be attributed to the mega structures of the universe. If scale is not an issue, meaning reality exists simultaneously in a quantum and macro level, who's to say there aren't different scales of consciousness or forms of intelligences at different variables to which we don't understand how they function, how they communicate with one another? Could stars be a form of brain neuron nodes to a higher brain, a, a galactic brain that we still do not fully understand the, the full means of how these neurons communicate with one another. Thanks for joining me. This is Felipe Osario, signing out.